Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Shannon Thrace, who is the author of 18 Months, a memoir of a marriage lost to gender identity. In this conversation, we talk about her experience of having been married to a man for 14 years who then decided that he wanted to be a woman or to emulate the feminine and to proceed along the route of social and medical transition and what that did to their relationship. And further than that, we get into how this marriage was founded on common values and how gender identity ideology just didn't add up to the same sort of values that Shannon Thrace established that relationship with. This interview is a fascinating portrait of some intimate experiences. And like all human relationships, they are very messy. But there's a lot of human in there, regardless. Links to Shannon's work, she's got a substack, and her book, 18 Months, are down there in the description. Without further ado, here is Shannon Thrace. Are you there? Yes. Ah, uh, there we go. Much better. All right, great. Do you go by Benjamin or Ben? I, I, I go all around the town by Benjamin. Okay. Right. When, I'm out on, when I'm out on the street. I have heard most people say Benjamin, so that's what I thought. But, you know, sometimes when you use a person's whole big name, they prefer a shorter one. Do they? Sometimes, yeah. Do you have a longer version of Shannon? Like Shenanon? No. <laughs> Shenanigans. <laughs> yeah. Shenanigan. That's it. Um, did you make that mousy pillow? That is a um, a painting or a digital art creation by the detransitioner uh, Laura Funk God, actually. Yes. Yeah. She's an artist. Yeah, it's very cool, I think. Is there a significance to the mouse? Um, Not to me. I don't know if there is to her. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought it was cool looking. Oh, cool. Yeah. And where are you from originally? Because you kind of have a slight accent, yeah. just like the slightest <laughs> right. accent. Right. Um, Southern Indiana and uh, Kentucky uh, okay. in those areas. Yep. Yeah. Kentucky is a very distinct accent. So. Does it come and go? Uh, with uh, probably, with yeah. I mean, I've, I haven't been living down there in some time, but certainly when I talk to my family – it comes back and yeah. I can kind of like bring it on on purpose. If I am down South and I feel like you it need might to blend in yeah. endear me to someone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You and you're doing your covert Kentucky ops. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So we were going to interview and then we were not going to interview, but it was around the publication of your book. Yeah. And your book's going to be republished. There's going to be an anniversary edition, yes. Okay. Um, and that's not till later in 2024? Yes, in the fall. Right. Oh, in the fall. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there going to be like fancy illustrations and extra? Uh, not, not inside, but it has a different cover. Okay. Um, it will have a foreword and I will have an audiobook edition. Oh, wow. Are you going to do that? You going to do that yourself? Uh, no, I, hmm. speaking of my Kentucky accent, I don't, <laughs> I don't love my voice. I also, huh. um, get tongue tied when I read for too long. So yeah, yeah. I have somebody else doing it. That was fun. Female. Yeah. I, yes. I yeah. Okay. Yeah. That'd be yeah. kind of odd to have a male. Yeah. Or maybe a male to female. I actually had a male to female offer and I thought, you know, it might be confusing just the voice, you know, I don't, I don't want someone to think for a while that it's a story about a gay couple and then have to readjust their expectations, you know? So, yeah. You know but what? It's actually, I thought it was kind of a cool idea though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're open to it. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Huh. That would have, that would have probably uh, sparked some controversy. Oh gosh. Yeah. For sure. For, for some reason, there's a lot of controversy in this corner. Right? Yeah. A lot going on. Especially, right. I think, recently. Like, yeah. I wouldn't have expected 
the way things have gone in this past few months, it's not something I would have expected a couple of years ago. Um, are you wanting to say something specifically? You want to well, put on your hazmat suit for country uh, music? <laughs> get it all ready? <laughs> Snuggle in? Well, I think, you know, one thing that's on all of our minds is the kerfluffle around uh, Genspect, which we both attended. Yeah. And uh, the presence of a man in a dress who said that he was a man. And uh, many of us, myself included, thought, okay, great. He says he's a man. I don't really care what he's wearing. Others apparently thought that because he was sexually motivated, it should have been stopped. And by the way, I adored your tweet about the uh, Ginspec dress code for next year just dropped. <laughs> Loved that. That was so funny. And a great response. Yeah, I got some responses. <laughs> it was so great. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, mm. I guess uh, to answer your question, I didn't expect so many people who call themselves gender critical to be saying that um, this person's dress code should have been policed. I didn't expect that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, and your perspective, uh, I mean, you could claim victim status of, I guess, trans identity or gender identity or AGP. You could sure, do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. As, do, uh, do you do that in your book? And victim status, while it has been weaponized, is not without reality. Sure. Yeah, I... I think no. I mean, to me, um, adult, adult relationships end all the time. They end for a variety of reasons. I'm an adult. I have bounced back and found another way forward. It was a long relationship. It was a 15-year relationship, so it was difficult and painful and sad. But to me, the reason why I wrote my book was not to say, hey, look at me, this sad, sad thing happened to me, please feel sorry for me. It was to say, um, and for those who don't know, my memoir is about being with someone for 14 years, a male person who came out as transgender, and then that last 18 months of our marriage really went downhill as a result of that announcement. Um, I wrote the book not to get pity, but to say I observe something really interesting and I think I have something to add to the cultural conversation around it. And largely because what I observed isn't what we're told should happen. So in other words, mm -hmm. this person got more unhappy with transition rather than happier. And, you know, this was, um, uh, in part sexually motivated and we're told that's not the case. And I just kind of wanted to tell the story of here's what happened behind closed doors. Here's the part people aren't seeing. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I accidentally interviewed a trans widow, which is what, um, and that even that's a contentious term, right? <laughs> yeah. We were going to talk about something completely different. And then it turns out that uh, her husband transitioned and mm. left her three kids and her behind. And then uh, I guess not really left the kids behind, but then impressed upon the kids that the kids now have two moms and mm. very in intense story. But I, you know, when I was going through and was really in the thick of the gender, uh, you know, just kind of mapping out, the shadow of the gender issue, uh, the stuff that which is not being promoted by the mainstream and just showing the reality on the ground. There were a bunch of different groups to interview. You know, there's the professionals, there's the writers, there's the researchers, you know, there's the psychologists, there's the detransitioners, there's the transitioners. And then there's these women whose husbands have transitioned, uh, which are, is called tra the trans widow. Now that's a contentious term because it means uh, people will argue about anything, but that's just the category. I don't know what you feel about that term. What do you feel about that term? 
I think it's fine. I don't actually go out of my way to use it, but um, sometimes I do just because it's it, people know what it means, and so it's shorthand. Yep. Um, I think, yeah, I think one of the objections is, and I hear this from the trans rights corner, hey, your person didn't die. It's not fair to use this term that implies that they died. And my response to that is, it is this other person who created the term dead name and who says the old me is no more and yeah. who in my case at least uh wanted to take all the pictures off the walls and put them away and pretend this person never existed and who didn't want me wow. to tell stories um that yeah. would have outed this person as a male and things like that so to me yeah there is an effort on the part of the trans person to hide and bury and deny the past and that is that's like a widowhood for the other person who has to suddenly just deny this huge past and pretend it didn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to finish, what I was going to say is that I've avoided speaking to trans widows because, as you brought up, relationships are so messy. Adults' relationships are so messy. And, you know, talking about a third person in the room, um, mm -hmm. it's just fraught. It's just fraught. Um, sure. Yeah. And I, I, I spoke with you about that when we met and mm -hmm. um, having read your book and spoken with you off the record, you're aware of that, you know? So anybody yeah. who, you know, yeah. brings up, like, I want to do, I want to understand what you understand, you know, but I, I also just have to say, this is another person's life. We're talking about another person. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then you are per somebody who is right next to that person. So your perspective it's just, it's not going to be the cleanest story. Even a detransitioner, like talking about their past, you know, is not going to be a clean story. And that's their own, mm. you know, that's their kind of their own. Uh, I mean, because like whenever we tell our own story, we're always kind of dealing with a narrative that ties it all together. So some facts or there's just like a way that a human being molds the past and molds memory. Um, so it's just, it's always as a storyteller you know, trained novelist myself, I always know that there's always this kind of thread of subjectivity, right? Mm, sure. The, that postmodernism has taken overboard, but it, there really is a subjectivity. Um, and that's what makes it real is because there is like, there's always meaning and truth kind of going back and forth and having a dialogue. I just wanted to say that as a kind of a disclaimer. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's fair. But would you like to tell the story from, I guess, loosely, more or less, of how you lay it out in the mem memoir? Where do you start in the memoir? So the memoir is called 18 Months, and it refers to the 18 months between my now ex-husband, who I call Jamie, uh, between his announcement that he wanted to cross-dress and the dissolution of our marriage. It's that trajectory. Um, yeah, so... I do certainly, in some flashbacks, tell more of my story. So um, Jamie and I were together 14 years when he made the announcement that he wanted to cross-dress, and that was in the context of having watched some transgender pornography. Um, and for about eight months, he cross-dressed with no major issues, no strong feelings about it. Um, he actually started a blog and said, I'm a man with a feminine side. I'm not transgender. I don't want to transition. Um, he actually said, I like my penis. I don't want to interfere with my sex life in that way. Um, and, and this was all his own, you know, his own doing, his own idea. No duress from me. And then about... How old? Uh, in his early 40s. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and then about eight months in, he started to identify as transgender. And then even for a period of time there, you know, like he said, I identify as a woman. And I said, what does that mean to you? Yeah. And he said, well, obviously, I'm not literally a woman. I'm going to live as one. I'm going to present as one. And so, um, and I should, I guess I should back up a little bit. Um, I'm a liberal and I've had a sexually adventurous past and I've dated women before and experimented with polyamory. And so the cross-dressing was not an issue for me. I didn't mind. 
and I was supportive. And even as he started to say that he was transgender, I was, you know, a little concerned because I was like, well, what does this mean? You know, and what's this going to be for our future? But he continued to be very reasonable for a few months and to say, I understand I'm not literally a woman. I'm just someone who wants to live as a woman. So I still mm -hmm. felt like things were okay. But then a few months after that, he began to say that he was literally a woman and that he had some kind of brain anomaly and that um, people like him were a subset of women. Um, and he also just took on some some of these beliefs that we that we see out here in the culture wars, this sort of idea that words are violence and that there were things I was no longer allowed to say because they were triggering or upsetting or transphobic or um, I couldn't even ask questions. Um, and then our marriage started to deteriorate, first with the communication, then our sex life, and then even our hobbies and stuff like that were no longer working for us because he didn't want to he had been a really outdoorsy person so camping hiking now he didn't want to wear clothes that weren't feminine enough and to go outside and to get dirty because it'd be hard for him to present and that sort of thing so he really his entire personality really did a flip and he was a different person and yeah. and all of those things began to wear on our intimacy in our relationship and eventually we uh divorced what, what was your knowledge about um transgenderism before he brought up the cross-dressing yeah well I, as someone who's dated women i have spent lots of time in drag bars and gay bars and um in my 20s i volunteered for an lgbt uh magazine help put that together um, so a long history with this community and in the years prior to Jamie's announcement, I had known two people that I would call transgender, although that wasn't the term they used at the time. They both used the term transsexual. They were both transitioned gay men and they were uh, people I met in my 20s. And, and then I didn't hear of another transgender person until maybe a year before Jamie's announcement. And then we became friends with a trans woman online who had a blog and kind of interacted there a little bit. Um, but then since Jamie's announcement, I now just know dozens. So I think it's really interesting that something changed there culturally. Uh, all, all the same time, it just became prevalent. Yeah. And I mean, part of that, of course, is that Jamie you know, Jamie um, joined support groups and got online and made friends and brought these friends into our house and all that sort of stuff. But then even since my divorce, I've just, you know, the number of times that I'm just sitting in a room with a few people at a cocktail party and somebody says, my son is transgender or my niece or my nephew or, you know, uh, my friend's husband or, you know, something like that. It's, it just happens all the time now. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you kind of said that you were open to it in the beginning, but how did you conceive of it or how did you have to start to think about it? I guess the cross-dressing is one thing. You have to, do you have to wrap your mind around that or just like whatever? Yeah. The cross-dressing was really no issue for me. And yeah. And, and one thing is that Jamie had experimented with clothing before and he was a musician. And so he had kind of gone through phases before, like a rockabilly phase where he was wearing, you know, cowboy shirts and, you know, uh, vests and with fringe or whatever, you know, something like that. And then, you know, another, another phase or whatever. And so for me, it seemed in character, you know, that Jamie might go, Hey, look what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to, I'm going to do this new thing with my clothing. Um, he also, not that it mattered to me, but during those first months, he dressed rather androgynously. So he might wear like a woman's shirt with big bell sleeves and flowers on it or something like that, but then still wear jeans and high tops and not wear makeup and maybe even have like a two week beard. So um, huh. he looked like a rock star, right? And um, 
even when he dressed more feminine than that, it just didn't bother me. I mean, I wasn't worried about it. And I didn't even find it unattractive because he was kind of just, he was just kind of wearing a little bit of flair. He wasn't yeah. really like putting on a face, which he did start to do later. And that was, that was harder for me because that was um, less attractive to me. And, and the, some of the ideology came along with that time period too, that changed. What was the relationship between the ideology and there's, there's something here. So, so you notice, so you're attracted to something in him and it's probably having, having to do with his masculinity well, you know, <laughs> do you have to think in this turns to understand. No, that's an like, interesting question. Actually, I uh, preferred women before I met him, and still do. Um, I am not attracted to hyper masculine men. Um, at the same time, Jamie was by no means femi. He certainly didn't look gay or anything like that, and he had a beard most of the time that we were together. Yeah. But he also, I guess, had kind of a musician look. So he he had long hair much of the time, and um, he kept his weight down, so he was kind of thin and you know youthful and had like swingy long hair. And so, to me, um, it was it mm. wasn't hyper masculinity, but it was it was him. It was. It was his looks, you know, um, I thought he was cute and I thought that the way he dressed was flattering. So yeah, that's what it was. But it's, it sounded like there, once he passed the barrier into the performance of womanhood, like the ideology came with it in order to yeah. maybe protect him or to allow him to know, he he knew he was getting away from something, so he needed to cling to something else. Maybe, I like how, almost, how was that ideology? Yeah, I almost wonder if it happened the other way around. Like, the more he started to, well, I guess not. I was going to say the more he started to dress up, the more he became entrenched in the ideology. But it's really hard to say. I think that all of it was facilitated by social media. So uh, when he first began to cross dress, we lived in the country and we moved to the city midway. Um, and in our old, in our small town, uh, in, in the country where we lived, when he began to get involved with cross dressers in real life, he joined a group that would do some social outings. And the cross dressers in that group were the cool ones. They were kind of young and they were more likely to go out and go to yeah. bars and go to drag shows and drink and have fun. And he identified more with them. And the trans women that were adjacent to that group were in their sixties and seventies and wore pearls and were kind of conservative. And mm. then when we moved to the city, the reverse happened. So when we moved to the city, it was more like, you see today, the trans people were young. They were 18, 20, 25, and they had blue hair and piercings and tattoos, and they were on the right side of the politics. And then it was the cross-dressers who were like these weird old guys who, you know, were on the fringe. And so I think that was an influence, and I think that the more he explored online and just – I do think he has an ego. I do think that he enjoys applause and, you know, we all do to some extent, but I think that the more he explored this world, the more the transgender identity seemed like the right thing to do and the cool thing to do and the natural progression of someone who's cross-dressing. Yeah. You just actually don't much see anymore men who cross-dress and just call it cross-dressing and who don't go further with it. And, when you do see that, when someone tells me they're seeing that, I say, come back to me in a year. Because I don't, it just, it uh, seems that the cross-dressing is turning into a transgender identity these days. There's a gateway. Yeah. There is something um, about, like, the rock star and the ego and the performativity. Because I'm thinking, well, if you want to cross-dress, like, what, what does that have to do with going out and 
doing that together as a group? Like, what kind of activity is that? I guess it's a social activity. I'm, I'm not a big social activity kind of guy. I don't like go out and do things that often, you know, and when I do, it's just me and Leslie or, you know, me and, a, me and one or two friends. Um, but I, I do understand that people, there are people out there who just have a natural innate desire to go out and go bowling or do some group activity, you know, like maybe rough up a few uh, streets, you know, uh, you know, protest some sort of government action um, <laughs> or something like that. So, but, but there's also this aspect of it that it sounds like instead of being a rock star, like instead of like f facilitating the desire that would put him on the path of being a rock star, being a performer, coming up with a set, doing all that work of being in a band and stuff like that, um, all that energy that would facilitate, um, you know, just having a band and doing that, all that energy kind of went into uh, cross dressing. So cross dressing was a lower form of performance, but it didn't come attached with any sort of. I guess I'm going to uh, have to retract the statement, any sort of mastery of a skill, but perhaps femininity was kind of like a guitar. Femininity was the instrument. That was the mastery. Like that, the, that artistic inclination was uh, kind of put into, channeled into uh, this idea of the feminine. Yeah. I mean, Jamie was a musician though. So he did have a creative outlet. It, that um, never went away. Uh, well, okay. Yeah. It it didn't go away while he was cross-dressing. Um, it did become an issue as he started to identify as transgender because then he didn't like his voice. And he didn't like his songs and his persona, which mm. had been really kind of a rambling blues guy, um, you know, Bob Dylan, uh, hobo kind of persona. And yeah. He, he couldn't make that work with a female identity. And so I think he has played music since, but at the time he said he didn't like his voice and he didn't want to perform anymore. But that wasn't before he started to pour some, some of that creative energy into cross-dressing. Um, I think that cross-dressing definitely appealed to his performative side and as a theater minor, just kind of appealed to him. He had, as I said, taken on other personas before and yeah. kind of maybe even mannerisms, mannerisms and things to go with that. So that wasn't new, but, and for the longest time, he didn't really like, he didn't really get super made up. So I'm just trying to decide if it was really when and if he started to pour his creative energies into dressing, because it kind of started out as a bit of an androgynous thing that he was having fun with and he wasn't putting a huge amount of thought into it. And then when he did start to put a huge amount of thought into it, it was an attempt to pass more than it was an attempt to... Oh flatter his features or or even to have fun with fashion it almost seemed to me like he stopped having fun with fashion and started to just obsess about how do i get my waist to look smaller how do i get my um hips to look wider how do i deal with these broad shoulders how do i deal with this yeah. square jaw and so yeah. um i think it probably got less creative as he started to do those things that sounds kind of obsessive compulsive. And I do know that, yeah. especially with the detransitioners, there's a lot of undi undiagnosed um, hyperfixation kind of stuff. And then the transgenderism allows them to really focus on, on the, you know, the shape of their wrist or the shape of their hips or the sound of their voice and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. did, yeah. did he, was he particularly obsessive before that or? I mean, I don't really recall seeing it. I don't think so, actually. It's hard to say. I mean, there are things I can recognize in retrospect, but other than just, I mean, as a musician, you know, he would sometimes spend long hours writing a song or jamming yeah. with friends or something like that, but really not not a, a level of obsession that I would have called that. Yeah. 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 And so for you... 
what there's this uh, there's this phrase called cognitive dissonance, and mm -hmm. I don't really understand it, but I, I I understand it as a term, but I understand it kind of as a feeling, but also um, just did you start to see things that didn't add up, and then how did you square those and like where where did you start to say we're parting ways and how we're looking at reality if that was yeah right i think yeah that's exactly what it was um when jamie was cross-dressing it was not a big deal when jamie started to say i identify as a woman but i'm not literally a woman it was um concerning in some ways but not it didn't cause me any cognitive dissonance because he wasn't saying anything that didn't add up. He wasn't lying or, you know, contradicting reality. I think when he started to say, I'm literally a woman or I have a brain anomaly or an endocrine anomaly, um, this really started to happen maybe in the last five months of our marriage before yeah. – I initiated a divorce, so I didn't um, <laughs> I didn't allow any cognitive dissonance to go on that long. Um, but I did start to I started to ask questions, and what I thought was, okay, you know, Jamie's going through something, and I can appreciate that. Um, it's just a matter of of getting him to speak honestly and openly about it, and to just let his defenses down, and to just be intimate again conversationally um and so you know you hear someone say something that's a little off and and you're like well let's just talk that through let's just talk about that um i really thought that because he had been reasonable in the 14 years prior that he could be reasonable you know and then we could talk mm. and so what it was more than cognitive dissonance i would say was just a series of surprises that hey this person doesn't seem to be who he used to be and i can't get mm. him to talk to me anymore and i can't we can't we can't talk this through and i don't understand why and yeah. that's not going to work for me but i'm trying okay. and i'm i think that a lot of that last 5 months more than more than cognitive dissonance or like some people use the term gaslighting. I don't really like that because I don't really think that he was fooling me in any way. It was more just that I was doing a little bit of a watch and wait and going, okay, we had a, a wonderful 14 year relationship. It's not worth throwing away the second something is slightly off. Um, I want to, I want to work through this. I want to watch and wait and talk and see if we can get on the same page because He's been reasonable for a long time, and I don't know why he wouldn't be reasonable now, but he wasn't, and it it wasn't possible to talk it through, and topics became off limits, and he really just drilled into an internal world that hmm. I couldn't be a part of, and it, it just wasn't uh, salvageable at that yeah. point but it took me like maybe a minute i mean it was heartbreaking you know it i didn't want to throw away a 14-year relationship and i also even when i started to see wow this is this is really a big thing and it's not going to work it was still just heartbreaking and just hard to go all right how do i how do i walk away from this i've invested yeah. 15 years of my life into this how did you know that was something that you would walk away from why like what was the yeah yeah so straw yeah i think there were lots of straws but um so over a period of time our communication deteriorated our sex life deteriorated and our ability to participate in hobbies and stuff together deteriorated and uh he was also crying every night and and behaving uh just very hysterically, I kind of don't like to use that word, but it just, everything was the meltdown. It, it just like being misgendered or not liking something that he was wearing or really? wondering what people were thinking about him or somebody looked at him funny really? in Applebee's. 
meltdown after meltdown and it was very very stressful for me and then at the same time we were also moving um and jamie quit working so i was the only one working and and there uh this confluence of stress occurred where i was doing all the work i was doing all the housekeeping i was his psychiatrist and nurse because he was just so um unhinged um we were moving with all the you know putting things in boxes and (laughs) and you know change of addresses and all the things that that entails uh it was very very expensive for us to move because um there was an overlap between selling one house and getting the other so i had two sets of bills um and then our sex life was bad and our communication was bad and our relationship was was in terrible shape and so all these things happened at once and i just was like losing my ability to even just you know stand it 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 was like i need a break i just need a break um and then i'm trying to remember the exact order of events but what i think occurred is that we had a fight and jamie said well maybe i should just leave for a minute and i was like Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> maybe you should, you know, and I, I thought, you know, I thought that he he was bluffing, actually, but I didn't know that. I thought that, you know, he was probably as stressed out as I was and that a break would have been a good thing. It turns out he was bluffing and that uh, he he left and then came back and kept calling me and, and all the sorts of stuff. So it didn't mm. really I didn't really get a break. And then I think to to get back to the straw, mm. um, what I did was I decided to go camping by myself for a week. And it was October, so it was really cold, and it was really hard to do. But I just just had to leave. I just wanted out, and I wanted to be in nature. I wanted to think. I didn't want to be in a hotel, and uh, I didn't want to be distracted. I wanted to write. Um, And I went on this camping trip, and I decided to write all of the problems that we would need to solve in order to stay together. And then all of the outcomes that I could imagine happening, all the possible outcomes, which was like, um, Jamie changes his mind or Jamie medically transitions and uh, we stay together. We break up. We have an open relationship because that's something that it just seems happens a lot in these situations. Um, Well, I listed all of these things and then I listed the things I liked about Jamie And then I looked at all of these lists and I realized that the things I needed weren't going to happen. The things I liked about Jamie weren't true anymore. Hmm. And the number of problems we needed to solve was just insurmountable. And um, that exercise made me say, okay, I don't think this is going to work. And I, I still at that point tried to have some conversations with him to that effect and to say, look, we're at a crisis point. Something needs to change, but um, nothing changed. And so yeah. I slowly began to accept my conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. What, what did you do for uh, solace for yourself? Did you have uh, any community or, <laughs> right? um, or were you pretty alone, isolated? I was pretty alone. Um yeah. I have always had a small social network while this was going on um, or shortly after I had two friends die. Um, I didn't, my mom lives far away and I didn't want to burden her either. You know, it's, Mm. she's old. It's not really an easy topic to broach um, and to, and to have a conversation that says, I'm okay with this to an extent, but I'm having a hard time. You know, it was, it was a very, she wasn't the right person. Right. And so I did get a therapist to help me a lot. Um, my friends were mostly mutual friends with Jamie who showed their support at first, but ended up siding with Jamie. Hmm. Um, so I really, I had very little social network actually. Can you recall or, um, suppositionize, uh, they're deciding who to support and why they chose Jamie? Well, okay. So Jamie went on a 
social media tirade and spread a lot of lies about me. That's oh. really where the where the loss of friends occurred. I think before that was this during the divorce or this was after the divorce. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Before that, I think there were two things happening. One is that some people genuinely were supportive of me. And another was that they weren't mad at me, but weren't sure what to do. You know, they were just kind of, um, this is the thing that happens when people start to break up is friends are like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know who to side with and I don't want to side with anyone and I'm just going to not touch it. And, yeah. You know, let's just not invite either of them to things or whatever, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, so there was that. There was people who were supportive and people who were on the fence or just not very verbal about it or whatever. But then when Jamie um, sabotaged me, I just lost a ton of them. And some of them explicitly texted me and said, I hear you're a horrible person and uh, a, an abuser. Jamie accused me of abusing him. Uh, so I'm out and then others just went cold and didn't talk to me anymore. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I sympathize with that, with you having, you know, just being dropped off a cliff like that. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. I mean, the, um, they say that some of the big stressors of life are moving, changing jobs, um, death, um, losing a relationship. I had all those things happen at once as yeah. well as this transgender thing, which isn't even on the list, but should be. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> huh. How did you cope? I mean, so my therapist was very helpful. Um, Were the, so you found a therapist that wasn't necessarily <laughs> affirmative of in the gender sense. I mean, I think that she is um, just really, really down to earth, um, very kind of um, more of a CBT type of person, you know, someone who's a problem solver, someone who says, OK, what's going on and how can we fix that? And pragmatic, not a person who uh, lives in the world of ideas. And so um I don't know how affirmative she is. It didn't matter. It didn't yeah, have anything to do with up. us. Yeah. yeah, she was very supportive of me. And okay. she and she said that. She said, I'm here for you. I'm that's who I'm here for. Um, so that was very good. The other thing I did is right after our divorce, I was really devastatingly sad and wasn't sure how to go on. Um and was mm. living in a new house that was bigger than I would have chosen if I'd known I was going to be living alone. And so it was just overwhelming. And I went uh, and applied for grad school and I went and got a passport. I had never traveled outside the United States before. And I didn't even know where I was going to go or if I was going to go Wait, anywhere. But you I went on like, the lamb. Is that what, is that where this story's going? <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> no, I didn't go on the lamb. I just, I just was like, I need to set myself up for future good things. And I set mm. myself up for a lot of them. I went to a Unitarian church for a minute, which I didn't end up sticking with. I went to a, a goddess group, which I did end up sticking with. Um, I just made a bunch of friends through different groups and clubs. I went to school and I started traveling and, um, it worked. Huh. I mean, at first I kind of did these things joylessly and was like, I don't yeah. know, you know, okay. yeah. um, but it, but it, it got a momentum. Right. And yeah. I mm. made friends and the friends were real friends and they stayed. And, um, you know, I, I did things that I didn't necessarily want to do, but knew that I needed to do. And I, I built a future that way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, back when I was like 1920, I discovered this guy named Carl Gustav Jung and got really into him because he's really fancy <laughs> yeah. ideas. And one thing right. that I remember from reading him was that he talked about, we, he spoke a lot about male psychology and how, you know, the male has this anima inside of him that he, mm. uh, he goes, he is his relationship to his soul. It's like a relationship 
between like an internal feminine kind of archetype. Mm -hmm. And you spoke a lot about um, like around 46, a man's, if a man is an extrovert, he becomes an introvert. Or if he's an introvert, mm. he becomes an, there's like, there's this big turning, there's this flip, a switch that flips in, in a man at this age. You know, there's this so-called midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. And I've, you know, I've joked around on the internet that, you know, men, you know, going through midlife crisis is used to buy, uh, buy a new car and get a 20 year old girl. But now the car and the girl are the same thing. And they try to become that 20 year old girl, but there's this, from your speaking about Jamie, it sounds like he went through a pr profound crisis of, of selfhood. And it sounds like there's a lot of things going on in there. A lot of just things in his life that he needed to process that he hadn't. And they all kind of came up and this transgenderism stuff led him down a path um, that was probably facilitated by his need to find out who he was at a certain point of his life and how he completely just collapsed into like behaving like a 20 year old, uh, unstable female, if I may uh, be slightly misogynistic, I don't mean to be, but like, you know, he's being hysterical. He's crying about all these things. What do other people think about me? You know, like it's a very, um, it's a very teenage way of, of, of being, and then completely like treating you like the mom and, this, uh, and his, his connection to earth. Um, yeah. and to such an extent that, that he, he betrayed you in a way, or you, know, you were not able to do that. It just sounds like a, there's a lot of archetypal, something's going on there. Um, a pattern that is ancient um, with male development and the transgender stuff was just a way that, that that shook out for him. There's also something that in your story that sounds like really archetypal. Um, like you, you have to reinvent yourself. You know, you have to kind of reset the clock 20 years and say, okay, I'm gonna do all the things that are, you know, you, you create a bucket list of things that you would have wanted to do if you had super ab abundant resources at 20 and you kind of go and you've uh, uh, just walk through the motions of pretending to be 20 again pretending to be a new person again. And I really like what you said, where you didn't have any joy in doing those things, but you started the ball rolling and you start, you just intentionally restarted your life. Yeah. And how was the book a part of that? How was writing this book a part of that? Or was it? Yeah, it certainly was. I certainly started writing to get things off my chest. And hmm. when I started writing, I didn't know if I was going to go through with writing a memoir, it was on my mind from the beginning, but I wasn't sure I wanted to do it because the major reason ironically is that I didn't want to embarrass Jamie because it's certainly full of facts about the situation that are embarrassing. Um, when Jamie sabotaged me, it kind of took that off the table. <laughs> it was mm. kind of like, yeah. okay, um, why am I, um, you know, walking on eggshells for Jamie when he's, you know, sabotaging me in this way. Um, and even for a while after that, I wasn't sure if I was going to do it. I wasn't sure how to handle, you know, I wasn't sure if there'd be legal issues. I didn't know if people would come after me. Um, I just, I didn't know how to handle pronouns. I just did, I didn't know a lot of things, but I just wrote it kind of in the same way that I just traveled and I just went back to grad school. I just wrote and wrote. And as I was writing some of those problems, the solutions to those problems started to reveal themselves. And I started to think, okay, yeah, I am going to do this. And, hmm. and then I started writing with vigor. Um, hmm. Yeah, it was certainly a part of healing. I mean, writing about that stuff, getting it off my chest, telling my side, that's certainly a part of healing. It's also some parts of it were very, very difficult to write. And once I've decided that I'm going to tell this story, I can't skip them. I have to tell them. And so yeah. in some ways it was also painful. Like what, there were what, scenes. What were the that points, just, the scenes like going through the memories? Uh, Yeah. So like in particular, there was a, a moment in which we had a fight that was that was just really ugly and I had this cup in my hand and I wanted to throw it and 
I didn't. And I, <laughs> I threw it in the sink and then I, you know, followed him through the house and, and um, it, it just, uh, I don't want to give too much of it away, but it was just messy and ugly. And then he later used it as an example of how I was abusing him. And it's like, Oh, that is not how it went, you know? Mm. And so it was just very, yeah. it, it was painful to relive it and it was painful yeah. to figure out how to write it because it's just hard to write about dramatic things and make sure you don't sound melodramatic right it's yeah. just very hard to to get that balance right and to just go okay how do i say this huh. and then it's just you know it was just it was just painful i wanted to forget about it i didn't want to hmm. you know analyze it in fine detail so but why was eventually it, i had to why do was that. it why was it important to the story? Um, I mean, I think it just was one of the big, one of the big turning points. Yeah. And it, um, I mean, what I said during that argument was, you know, I need to be a participant in my own life. And I, I thought for sure that hmm. that would make sense to him, but it kind of didn't. And he kept talking about what he needed. And, and so it was just super infuriating for me. Wow. And it was yeah. just really weird to not be heard. And um, there was just so much about it that was uncomfortable and embarrassing, you know, for me on how I acted and infuriating on how he acted and all the things. And it was just complicated and I didn't want to relive it, but I needed to, to, to tell the story. Um. <sighs> Do you think that had you, or to what extent did you guys have a shared ideological structure um, on a transcendent, religious, or philosophical level, like on the meaning of life? Did you guys have a shared perspective, and what was that structure? Yeah, I mean, to me, I, we had a nearly identical worldview before this occurred which was part of why this was really weird for me and really hard for me to process. Um, I mean, we were both atheists. We also both um, kind of understood like the Nietzsche death of God crisis of modernity, meaning shaped whole kind of problem. And we talked about it a lot and we talked about, you know, how do you make meaning in life and, yeah. and do meaningful things and, find love and show compassion to others and do volunteer work and do things that address this meaning shaped hole that everyone has mm -hmm. uh, because we live in a modern world and because we don't, Jamie and I did not believe in God and we couldn't make ourselves believe in God. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked about that stuff a lot. Um, we were both politically liberal um, we were both feminist. I know some people will say men can't be feminist, but for all the, you know, all the feminist issues, he was aligned with me. Um, I mean, hmm. we got along great. We had really great conversations and intelligent conversations and, um, seldom argued about anything substantial and had a lot of fun talking. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, to me, I wouldn't have even been able to tell you before this about something major that we disagreed on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when, uh, when you brought up Nietzsche and he, um, his diagnosis of the death of God, um, pretty revealing. Um, but then he, you know, he, he diagnoses and then he tries to make a prognosis, like, well, how do we solve it? And one of the things that he comes up with is this Ubermensch. You have to create your own meaning. But other than an Ubermensch, he went, your Jamie went Uber fra, uh, <laughs> right? Tries to create himself, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the that's the answer is to create yourself. Yeah, but I, yeah, I guess I wouldn't have. <sighs> Sure. I but... just wonder, I'm, I'm asking on a, on a philosophical, ideological yeah. level, is this, is the destabilization of all meaning, is postmodernism, is gender identity the necessary outcome of a liberal atheist worldview? This is a very big question. You don't have to mm. answer it. But I'm, I'm wondering, without a traditionalist um, pattern, ideological pattern, 
do are people inevitably going to be um, seduced by um, these you know very destructive ideologies? I don't think so. I no. mean, okay. um, it hasn't happened to me. And um, also, I would mm. have thought, had we discussed this during those times when we had these conversations, um, I would have thought that creating yourself means doing something meaningful and doing something for others and building community. I see what Jamie did as very inwardly focused very self-centered, hmm. uh, very individualistic, um, very image conscious, which seems like really not not one of our values, um, and not a not a good value. I mean, I, I think we all hmm. you know we all care what we look like to some extent, but um, I wouldn't have expected him to make that a focus. Um, I think that in some ways I think that atheists should care more about community and meaning and uh, giving than believers because we don't have an afterlife where this is going to get resolved. We have to do the right thing here and now. Um, we have to prove that uh, – relying on our moral intuition works that we will feed the poor without God telling us to, because we're saying that we're saying you don't need, you don't need God to know that you should feed the poor. Well, we have to be those people who do that. You know, mm -hmm. we can't just say those words and then become, you know, a self-centered narcissist who cares about how many Twitter likes we have. Yeah. And so I just, I didn't, I didn't expect that. I don't think that's inevitable. I know what you're saying. There's I'm just a questioning struggle. because yeah, I, could, I can hear to, that. Yeah. yeah, to figure out what that meaning is. Um and I'm sure it, it gets answered in all kinds of ways. I don't I don't think it's inevitable. Yeah. What about your meaning then? Well, wh while writing my memoir, I I zeroed in on some things and I decided that my highest values were compassion and honesty and bravery. And I feel like having pinpointed that, that it says a lot about what went wrong because, mm. um, especially with honesty, uh, it was very difficult for me to live with Jamie in a world where I was expected to say, to him, yes, I believe you are a literal woman. Um, that's not something I believe. I was fine with publicly referring to Jamie the way he wanted to be referred to, but I don't think he's a literal woman. There's a difference between a woman and a man who identifies as a woman. Um, and so... Mm -hmm. I couldn't, that was an obstacle for me in terms of honesty. And I felt like he was not being intellectually brave when I tried to ask questions and he said, oh, I won't hear that. That's triggering. I don't feel safe. Um, that's not something we can talk about. That's a dog whistle for a worldview that I can't support. Um, you know, to me, a question, just like the Socratic method, a question is a question. You know, it doesn't contain hidden meanings. And you should be able to ask a question. And you should be able to talk and get answers and talk about the answers. But that wasn't something we could do anymore. So, hmm. um, I, and, and certainly when Jamie sabotaged me, that was not an act of compassion. And so he had lost his sense of empathy in the interest of this thing that he was pursuing and so um hmm. all of these values that i hold dear seem to be slipping away from us and if you if it's possible if it's ever possible um if it's even possible uh to disentangle the uh ideology from the person who believes in the ideology it's going to be always going to be open question to what 
degree is this Jamie's working out his own issue. And what I want to ask is that if he, if you look at your values and I assume you guys shared those values beforehand, courage, uh, honesty, mm. compassion. Um, I, I'm wondering to what, what was it about that ideology that allowed for the loss of those values or the, um, you know, the, the devaluation of those values? Okay. Was there something well, about the ideology you think if we can look so, past his psychology? Yeah. Oh, well, look past his psychology. My answer, I'm not sure if my answer is going to meet that criteria. Okay. I think that, uh, but I think it will actually, I think that, putting aside some aspects of the ideology that are just things that people repeat on social media and just zeroing in on the aspect of this that says that who you are is, is something that's really important and really important to transmit to the world. I think that alone is a, is a place where I'm departing from Jamie. So, hmm. um, I don't, I don't feel like identity is important. And I, I feel like if you're humble and you're honest and you're intellectually curious that the last thing you're trying to do is go, Hey, everybody, here's what I am. Here's my list of labels. Please respect them. Please acknowledge and, and, you know, uh, and care about these labels. I, I feel like that's a really weird self-centered way to approach the world. I feel like, uh, stoicism calls for, hey, I'm here to listen. I don't know everything. It's not important whether you understand me or not. It's kind of like, um, you know, there are songs that say, um, like teenage angst songs that are like, I'm so misunderstood. And it's like, yeah, no kidding. Who cares? You know, it's just like, it's not important <laughs> to be understood, right? Like, and so, hmm. you know, there's the question of, which is a question I could never get an answer for, of course. There's the question of, Jamie, what makes you a woman? You know, and of course, you don't get an answer to that. Because if he were to say, oh, I'm, you know, sensitive and I like to cook, then that's sexism, right? And he knows that. Okay. And so I, yeah. I could never get that answer or, or another answer. And so, and so... The question is, okay, what makes you a woman and why is it important for whatever that is to be transmitted to the world? And why is it important for you to get the world to say, say it back to you? Because that's the other thing I think is that like humility calls for um, yeah. accepting the fact that not everybody thinks the same thing about you that you want them to think like I would love for people to think I'm an artist, you know, but people have every right to go, nah, you know, your stuff sucks. <laughs> You're not an artist, you know, uh, and, and that's just part of life. Like you can't, you can't insist that people see you the way you see yourself or the way that you would like for them to see you. So mm. I don't know. I think there's just something right out of the gate that is, that's really immature yeah. and that is um there's an image consciousness and a a self importance that just doesn't feel like the right way to live um i i'm trying to th figure out a way to communicate this to like a teenager it's like okay so the way that you are in the world will be seen by other people and people will mistake you and they won't give you the recognition that you desire. Um, but every act that you do will transmit a signal. Um, and that signal ultimately is your values. So what are the values that you want to transmit into the world? If you want to transmit, um, well, and then you have to see, well, what are the good values and what are the not as good values or the bad values? You have to make a, a valuation of values. And if you say that, 
And the, that's kind of what you're saying is that when you yeah. boil down the ideology, you know, and you try to turn the cranberries into cranberry sauce, what you get is this very self-obsessed, very fragile set of values mm -hmm. that is relying on image and demanding or, and it's kind of hypo agent. Um, so everybody else is in control of how I feel. Everybody else is in mm -hmm. control of how I feel because I want them to affirm this thing. Mm -hmm. So if you take out the identity part, like whatever that is, the, that being a woman, um, you know, uh, yeah. if you take yeah. that out, like what you're left with is, uh, a, transmitting a value that is weak because it's completely reliant on other people and it's completely tied up in image. And so if you want to transmit something other than that, if you want to transmit bravery, courage, honesty, then you just have to be those things. You have to practice those things. Right. And it doesn't, and if people are, don't see that, that doesn't really affect the fact that you are honest, you are brave or or not. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. I think you're really hitting on something that I kind of meant to say and just never got to, which is rather than saying you are something, why not just be that thing? Yeah. And so if you want to be a musician, you have to play a lot of music and you yeah. have to, you have to finish it and put yeah. it out there and let people hear it. You know, they, no one's going to call you a mu musician or an artist. If this is just something that you're, thinking on in your head and not not acting upon and it's yeah. the same with being a woman it's like are you you know what what are those values that you think are womanly that you think you have yeah and uh if those are important to you why not just do those things like if you want to be nurturing or if you want to be someone who cooks or <laughs> whatever those yeah. are uh, why not why not do those things and do them well instead of saying this makes me a woman. And, and I don't even think that Jamie, you know, it doesn't matter, but Jamie didn't do a lot of these womanly things, right? He, Jamie wasn't, Jamie didn't like children, you know, or uh, do a lot of caretaking or whatever these things, these stereotypes are. It wouldn't have mattered if he did, he would still be a man, but um that is part of the that's part of what I was trying to say for sure. It's like what what is the significance of just making these announcements? Like, isn't it better to just be something yeah. and to and to genuinely do the thing yeah. rather than talk about how you do the thing? And even if you uh allow for um these womanly virtues to be uh if if, if you kind of take them at face value and say, okay, like these might be sexist, these might be regressive, but what are the womanly or the feminine virtues? And you'll come to a set, I think you can boil down just through a process of stereotypical association, you'll come down to a set of values that some of them are more deep and lasting and eternal than others. Some of them are, are good and some of them are shallow or not as good. And so what are the good ones? Like nurture, like you said, like if, if we do mm -hmm. just play the game, Caring, nurturing, um, patience, uh, you know, courageous and, you know, and loving, um, connective, compassionate, um, commun co communicative, social, uh, mm -hmm. you can go through and, the, and eventually they break down and they're no longer exactly, um, uh, feminine or mas masculine or gendered, but there are some gendered stereotypes, but each one of the good ones actually takes work. Mm -hmm. And takes character and you're not being a woman. You're the question isn't, are you a woman? The question is that you're pursuing, am I a good woman? And if you want to be a man, like you don't try to be a man, you try to be a good man. There's no sense in me trying to be a man. There is sense for me in my life to try to be a good man. And what is that? What does that require? What does the world require of me? What are the uh, what are the strengths that I have that my my wife doesn't necessarily have? And then I fill in those gaps in our relationship. And it so happens that it's probably the case that if I do take on those masculine roles and virtues, that'll probably be more attractive to my partner because she is kind of naturally attracted uh, to that, you know, because that's just how we are as heterosexual entities. But there are there is a deep level to that, and the transgender ideology or whatever that is, is not focusing on those good virtues. It's not That's prizing right. those good virtues. It's saying those virtues don't matter. What mm -hmm. really matters is these other set of virtues that if you boil them down are pretty fragile. 
So mm-hmm. I think that you can take a non-political, um, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to formulate along with you is a non-kind of political argument or a non-intellectual argument maybe, um, or philosophical argument against whatever it was that um, your ex-husband uh, became a believer and adherent to. Like whatever this set of belief mm-hmm. is that has to do with gender and transition and, and all this stuff. We can make a philosophical argument based, uh, you know, on, on, on just uh, on virtues um, as to why it's not necessarily good. And then through that, probably explain, um, not explain away, but explain um, the, why it led to the dissolution of your marriage, like why it broke your marriage apart. Yeah, I, th- I think you make a great point. I mean, Yes, if Jamie had said, I'm a woman because I love children and I'm very nurturing and I want to start, you know, taking over making Thanksgiving dinner and take care of your mom. And, you know, while he still wouldn't have been a woman, those would have been admirable things. Those would have been things that you could that you could be proud of and happy about. Instead, Jamie's idea of womanhood involved clothing and sexual passivity. And as far as I can tell, nothing more. And and those two things, huh. certainly you talk about uh, weak values. I don't think that wearing makeup and wearing women's clothes is a value at all. People can be great hmm. people without wearing feminine clothes, whether they're female or not. Um, hmm. Sexual passivity, too, is more of a preference than some sort of s- something to be proud of. It's It's not, these aren't, these aren't virtues. These are superficial. Hmm. Um, well, they're stereotypes, but the also, yeah. yeah, it's very superficial behaviors that yeah. aren't, aren't what makes women interesting. Hmm. Yeah. That might be, um, the biggest warning, like avoid any ideology that makes you uninteresting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, your book is in between printings, but we still got to shill it because you're on a podcast and that's what we do oh, it's, here. No, it's, it's, it's out. It's on Amazon. It can be okay. purchased. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Say the name, the title and, and the blurb. Oh, you can show us the it cover. Is, it is called 18 Months, hmm. a memoir of a marriage lost to gender identity. It can be found on Amazon and in bookstores, although it may need ordered from bookstores. Hmm. Um and what else? The blurb? Yeah. It's a it's or, about my um marriage. Uh it's about my the revelation of my husband after fourteen years of marriage that he wanted to cross dress and then is uh hmm. uh coming out as transgender and what that did to our marriage. Hmm. Yeah. On a on a more or less more ideological level, how has this changed your idea about gender nonconformity in men? To go back to the tire topic of a blue <laughs> dress on a mountain, right? Yeah, right. To what degree is it disturbing to you to see uh, men playing around with their gender expression in public? And to what degree... Does it trigger you or concern you that there might be a sexual component to men uh, who want to dress in a feminine way? Yeah, I'm not I'm not triggered at all. I'm not concerned at all. I would not date another man who cross dresses because that was trouble. I I actually am not dating men anyway, but um, I think that there's a difference between what we want in our life and what we think should be a policy, or at least there should be a difference. Um, and so my personal feelings about whether I would get involved with somebody who is doing that are a whole different issue. I don't think that we should police gender nonconformity. I don't think we can read people's minds. Um, and I don't even think it matters what their motivations are. I don't think that we can, uh, we can't, uh, get men to not have any sexual thoughts in public. I mean, all kinds of people are having all kinds of thoughts that we may or may not be able to guess. And that's not illegal yet. And I don't want that to be illegal. Mm. I don't want, um, 
clothing uh, as long as it's you know appropriately has appropriate coverage for the occasion <laughs> i don't want clothing to be illegal i want clothing that would be acceptable on a woman to be acceptable on a man and vice versa i'm not um i find it very very illiberal that people are saying um this person had motivations that i don't know you know give me the creeps and therefore this needs to be policed i don't agree with that hmm. and what are you looking forward to in uh, 2024 now that it's on the verge of happening gosh um i am always looking forward to travel i'm hmm. going to europe again not sure exactly where but uh, that's always something I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to my book uh, anniversary edition. Um, hmm. Yeah, those are some of the big ones. Hmm. And do you, what's your what's your hobby? Oh, you said you're an artist, right? Or was I that do, just an I example? Drawing. No, I do. Yeah, I I do some drawing and painting. Um, I am. I work in IT and I mess around with websites and stuff for mm. fun as well. Um, I am very outdoorsy. I love to go hiking and camping and uh, work with animals and I volunteer for some organizations that work with animals. And what's your favorite animal? Probably a goat. Oh, really? Yeah. Well. And I'm a cat person, so a cat, but that's like kind of the easy one. Yeah. A cat is what I will have as a pet, but a goat is my next, like, yeah, they're so, um, they're so comical and fun and cute. Huh. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. We have chickens. They creep me out, but they, but they're really oh, cute at right. the same time. I remember Leslie saying that I'm kind of jealous of that. I think that's, uh. Advanced homesteading. That was I, yeah. They always run up I to me to. and want pets. Well, I think they want me to mount them, <laughs> but um, it's the same thing to them because they're just little, little lizard brains, you know. Yeah. They just want Fun. attention. Do you eat the eggs? Uh, yeah, we eat the eggs, not the chickens. Okay, cool. Yeah, these aren't these aren't eating chickens, so they're our friends. So. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. But the eggs are delicious. Yeah. If you're ever in town, we'll, we'll make you an omelet. Oh, sweet! Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Shannon, for your time. Um, and I will wrap up the recording. You want to say goodbye to the audience? Yeah. Um, goodbye, everybody. Read my sub stack. Um, oh, wait. Well, you have a sub stack. You didn't plug that. I do. I do. What is I it? have a sub stack. Say it out loud. Shannon, shannonthrace.substack.com. Okay. And I talk about these crisis of modernity and death of God things and oh, right a little bit about gender and also just a little creative writing and. Uh, all kinds of different things. Oh, sounds very smorgasbordy. Kind of. I think there's a there's a running theme, but yeah. yeah. Fun. Well, that'll be linked yeah. down in the description along with links to your book. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely.